Hey everybody, we're gonna talk about the most common questions I get from Mount Top. So for those that don't know, a few years ago I did a whole year of seminars where all I did was teach Mount Top position. Um, even more uh, precise than that, I only taught one version of Mount Top, which is a low mount. And I taught that seminar about 20 times all around the world. I got asked a lot of questions during the course of that year. Many of the same questions came up, and I'm gonna address five or six of the most common questions today. So the first question that comes up the most often was the reason why I decided to do a year of nothing but mount top. Uh, so there's, there's two things about mount. The first one is everybody that trains Brazilian Jiu Jitsu for more than a few months knows how important mount is. When you're competing in an IBJJF tournament, it's one of the only positions that gives you four points. Um, it awards those four points. They gave it four points because of the damage you can do from mount top with strikes. Everybody knows if you're in MMA or you're in a fight, the amount of punishment you can take from bottom and the amount of punishment you can deliver from mount top. That was one of the first indications of, of the power of jiu-jitsu if you go back and watch the early UFCs and, or Hickson's fights. The second thing is it's, it's unique. Uh, one of the cool things about mount, mount and guard, close guard in particular, the, the upside down version of mount, is one of the things that makes Brazilian Jiu Jitsu unique amongst the other grappling arts. So every warrior culture, every culture around the world has a, a native grappling art, whether you're talking about uh, Scandinavia or um, Native Americans, you name it, they all have their own grappling arts. And most all have various uh, versions of headlocks, cross sides top. But what the Brazilians did when they modified Japanese Jiu Jitsu back in the early 20s and 30s is they put a, a heavy emphasis and development on mount top and guard bottom. And that's one of the things that makes BJJ unique. And uh, you know, you're not gonna find wrestlers, for example, using mount top on each other. So it's a really important kind of iconic position in the art. But, and this is one thing I've noticed, I've been doing, I've been a black belt in BJJ for 17 years. I've been practicing the art for 27 years. And it wasn't really until the last three or four years, not even that, maybe two years, where I felt as comfortable holding someone big, strong, and explosive down from mount as I did from cross sides. And I noticed uh, over the years that that was very common among black belts. Every once in a while, you're gonna get somebody who's very, very good at mount, Hodger Gracie, uh, any of the original Gracies, Hickson, of course. But by and large, if you were to pull a large group of, of black belts and ask them, do they feel more comfortable holding someone explosive down from cross sides or more comfortable from mount? I would predict that the vast majority will tell you some variation of cross sides, and I was no different. So when I got somebody that was, was powerful or, or pretty good at jiu-jitsu, I would go back to cross sides. And for a while I thought, well, maybe that's just the nature of mount. But one thing that hinted otherwise was I was fortunate in my early years of doing jiu-jitsu, my first, the person who gave me my first belt was Hickson Gracie, and having been under Hickson's mount, I realized I've, I've experienced that, and I know how powerful it was. And my coach, Purple Through Black, for most of my career, Chris Howder, even though he's a light middleweight, has a very strong mount too. So I knew it was possible. So there's a disconnect between how important we all know mount is and how well people usually hold mount. And so the main question I would get, and it was the reason why I, I chose to do a year of mount was, why? Why does that exist? And I think there's two answers for that. I'm convinced there's two answers for that. The first one is lack of details, and the second one is connection. So very often when we're teaching cross sides top as black belts or we're learning uh, cross sides top, there's a whole bunch of details you're given about how to kill the arms, how to shift your weight, what you're supposed to be doing with the head. All that becomes very important. And the instructions that were given usually for mount were pinch your knees together, don't sit on them, and maybe climb as you can lift the elbows up, but lack a lot of details. So that's the first thing is if you miss those details, if, if you skip those fundamentals, your ability to hold that position goes down dramatically. And I think most people, not everybody, but a good portion of people haven't been trained in the fundamentals of mount. So that's number one. Number two, mount is one of the positions on cross side uh, on top where you have less connection, depending on which mount you use, than you would from cross side. So it, it's harder to feel, if you, again, if you're not trained in those details, what's going on, which is also why when I decided to make a year of mount, I decided to work on low mount. Now the exception to that is if you've ever worked with Heeren or Hickson or any of the original Gracies, you know that their mounts are ridiculous. 
And the thing to keep in mind about that is they've been training since they were five or six years old, and they've been working games from Mount Top, the same games I teach my kids now, since they were five or six years old. And those games get skipped by adults. We usually don't teach those games to white belt adults, but we should, because incorporated in those games is really important movement. And I'll give you one example now that will illustrate my point. So, Zach lays on his back. Lay here, point your head that way. Come a little closer. And all I want you to do is straighten out your legs, put your arms like here on your belly or on your chest, and just roll like a log that way. Good, come back. So if you've done, if you've seen any of the uh, Gracie instructionals for teaching kids, you're probably familiar with this movement. Zach's gonna roll that way. And one thing you learn to do is just keep this leg light so he doesn't roll on it. So if he's going this way, I'm keeping my left leg light so I stay on top and don't get rolled over. Now if I don't do that, if I don't learn to be light with his foot and lift it up, what happens when he rolls that way is right here it frees, I'm trapped. Now my foot gets trapped, and even if I do have my hands on the mat, I'm connected to him, he's gonna roll and get on top. So just having the skill set just to intuitively keep the leg light in the direction that they're moving is very important. Now we translate that to a low mount. Go ahead and lay down again. Put your knees on the mat, or feet on the mat, sorry. When I'm in this low mount position, Zach grabs my arm, and he goes to roll me this way. The connection there, the thing that I have to do is to uh, drop my left hip down and pin his right hip to the mat. So if we look, I'll keep your head that way. Bridge and upa like you're gonna go that way. Breeze, go back, come back, go slow. Lift, lift, lift. Right, freeze. So you can see this is the hip that's coming off the mat. When I'm in a low mount position, I have a much better connection to Zach, and when I, I can feel when that hip's coming off the mat, I can drop my weight on it. That is enough usually, especially if you catch early, like everything in jujitsu, to keep him from rolling me. But I also want you to notice what I'm doing, what you did that way, with my right foot. So you'll see me drop my left hip down and have a shadow hook here with my, my left leg. But as I do that, and he goes to roll me this way, my right foot's light. So it's never gonna get trapped. And even if I miss and I'm a little late here to pin his hip and he keeps going, you'll see my foot's not gonna get caught underneath him. And I can make a transition to side mount. So that's a real simple detail that if you've been working that drill since you were five or six, you're gonna pick up immediately when you start training. But you, if you don't understand the reason for it and you don't understand the application, then of course, when you get on top of somebody big and strong, they grab your arm, you're gonna get rolled. One of the second questions I got very often was people get thrown off from mount. And this is another one we have to remember that when we're training in the gym, you're always working, especially after you pass the very beginning phases of the art, working with other people who are brand new. We're, we start to play a game that's jujitsu versus jujitsu, or trained MMA athlete against trained MMA athlete. He's going to respond with certain counters that are the right counters. But what it means by definition is I spend the majority of my time learning how to defend against elbow knee escape and not worrying about somebody that's just gonna grab me and throw me off. Downside of that is if you're in a, all of a sudden in an altercation and you take them out and you're not used to it, you're gonna have somebody big and strong on you, guess what? They don't know how to do an elbow knee escape or what that is, they're gonna grab you and throw you off. So here's a real common one, just to give you an example. He'll lay down with his head pointed this way. And what I'll have Zach do is just put your hands in my armpits, right? And then what I want you to do is kind of throw me that way. And now put this hand behind you and just get up. Yeah, keep this one on me and just push me over like you would if you didn't know your chest. All right, go back. So do it explosively. Right, so this is, this will happen more than you think. And I've taken, actually before I've, done classes like this, for example, at the police academy with one of my purple belts who's very, very good at mount, but unused to this position, and then he gets a mount on some of these guys, they don't know what to do, and they're, they outweigh him, this would be a very common movement. So again, this goes back to rewinding the tape and focusing on fundamentals and the stuff that's very important. When we're working from cross sites top, we know to kill the arms, but very rarely are we taught um, how to kill the arms from mount. 
And so that's one of the first places I started with the seminar, is dividing up the upper body from the lower body and practicing it against the different things you can do here. So the first thing is, you'll notice when I'm on top, my hands are always wide at 45, not here, where I'm vulnerable sideways, and not here, where he can bump me forward. But here, my elbows are bent a little bit. He goes to grab an arm. I just press it into the mat, try and pull my arm in. It's very, very hard. I'm in a pretty good position there. He tries to overhook. Same thing, it's very hard to pull it in. I can leave that pressure there, go ahead, and then leave my elbow where it is and re-pummel pretty easily. So now it's hard for him to get me off base. He starts to throw me that way with his hands at my armpits. I connect to his neck and post out here. Now go. Now he's pushing against himself, even if he's a lot bigger and stronger than I am. So it's actually a very simple counter, but again, if you haven't trained it, you get caught off guard. So he goes to throw me the other way. I'm connected, holding myself on. Another one that's common that, that we forget about is he's just gonna push me straight up. Yeah, if he doesn't know any better, that's one of the first things he'll do. So go back. So what you wanna do there is relax your body. My upper body's relaxed, so I'm heavy. As he goes to push me up, I let him carry my weight and then work that basic swimming motion. One hand at a time, bringing my shoulders through. And then from there, we start working angles and deflecting. So as he goes to push, I'm gonna change the angle. You don't do anything. And slide back down, just push straight up. Right, changing the angle of my body and getting back behind the elbow. Now if we look, it's a bad shoulder. Okay, push. If we look at this position, once I'm behind the elbow, that's the equivalent of killing the arm from cross sides top. And I can go ahead and grab that or I can start to work for my submission game. So little details like that become very important. If those get skipped and we go right away to mount and then we just start working against elbow knee escapes, you can get thrown off guard. And like I explained in my seminar, even two black belts, I've watched footage of Hodge Gracie sparring and I, he has one of the best mounts I think in the world. And you'll see even there, when he's training with one of his black belts, the elbow knee escape doesn't work right away. They make a big explosive shove on the rib cage or torso and then go back to hit the elbow knee escape. And in that moment, even with world-class black belts, there's a space to kill frames and kill the arm. So we need to go back and make sure we're working those fundamentals. Okay. One of the other questions I got asked a lot was elbow knee escape. One of the reasons people have trouble with mount is just how well the elbow knee escape works in jiu-jitsu. You can get somebody much smaller than you. They could be 150, 160 pounds. If they have a very good elbow knee escape, even if you're a heavyweight, you'll find yourself being put back in half guard or full guard pretty quickly, right? Uh, unlike cross sides where you have all your weight bearing down on them and you can smash them more. So if you haven't been shown a lot of details on how to counter the elbow knee escape and your only instruction was pull up on the arm, you're gonna struggle. So I'm gonna show just a couple examples of these details and uh, I'll give you an idea of how complex it can get. So Zach <coughs> lays here with his head pointed that way. Again, I'm working from a low mount and the reason why I chose low mount is because low mount gives me a connection to him that I don't have from middle mount. Now this is, this is what I call middle mount. And this is what I call, we refer to as high mounts. So there's basically three different mounts when you're like that. The entire year I worked mount, all I was teaching was really low mount. And here I'll have my feet touching, prayer feet, or cross, and as close to his tailbone as possible. So if I can get here, I'm gonna keep it there because it makes it more difficult trying to untie my feet. More difficult to untie my feet. He has to be a little more flexible to get his heel up to my feet, which we'll talk about later, right? But from this position now, my upper body can relax. And one of the things that happens, I'm in mount, very slowly go for an elbow knee escape here. He starts to go for an elbow knee escape and the person, you start to attack, defend this arm. So you lift up, right, and you go here. Don't let me pull your elbow up. See, if I ask Zach not to let me pull my, his elbow up, I'm not going to pull his arm up. And look at all the space I gave him. My attempt to lift up and go after this arm gave him the space he needs, right? Now, if I say instead, same speed, go for the elbow knee escape. <clears throat> See, all I've done is relax. He has to struggle to do what? To get this arm across. And that's one of the important details. 
when I'm defending against the elbow knee escape, whether I'm at middle mount or low mount, this isn't the arm I'm mostly worried about. This is. If he can't get this across my body to here, it's very difficult for him to elbow knee escape with that. So we'll look here, I'm gonna pin that arm like this, just leave that there. Now elbow knee escape with that arm. And it's very easy, I can just pluck it off with plenty of time. Now he adds that arm, same thing. That's where it becomes problematic, go back. So by relaxing my body weight here, when he goes to uh, elbow knee escape, I don't accommodate him by lifting up for him to pull that arm across, so it's very difficult. And as he starts to slide it through, slide it through, I sprawl on it. So again, I'm dropping my left hip down more and pushing the left side of my body connecting into Zach's ribcage, trying to get the arm across it. It's hard, right? Yeah. All of which buys me time to pluck that arm off. So <clears throat> details like that become very important. You can see also, Go ahead and set up why I chose low mount. Because low mount, I think, is an easier mount for beginners to learn for white belts. And my theory was I could do two days of low mount, students could then go and apply that information right away in a jiu-jitsu tournament. And we've gotten lots of uh, proof over the course of the last couple of years that that happened. People were going in and taking this information and applying it in competition immediately. Middle mount is awesome. And in the future, I plan on doing some instructionals and maybe an entire year where I focus on my seminars on teaching that, but it's a little more complex, a little harder to pick up, I think, in the beginning because you're not connected to their body in the same way. When I'm in that low mount, Zach is carrying my weight in a way that he's not from middle mount. And I can feel what he's trying to do from bottom much easier than I can from middle mount. So I think it's a great starter to uh, developing a, a really nice mount top game. One of the other questions I got asked a lot about was finishing from mount top, how to get submissions from mount top, and people would start to get better at holding each other down, but struggle to, to uh, actually finish. A couple things there. Your ability to finish people from mount top goes up exponentially when you start to get better at holding them down. The better you are, I mean, I know I'm preaching to the choir here, everybody knows position before submission, but it was really proven true to me over the course of that year teaching mount top because by the end of the second day, when people started to get really good at holding the low mount, much better than they were before anyway, you would find that their, their opponents on bottom wound up having to use a lot more energy and push a lot harder and, and take greater risks in an attempt to escape. And that makes uh, submitting them so much easier, so much easier. I mean, people who can lay there and just stay in a tight structure, they're hard to submit. As soon as you start putting pressure on people and then attacking the neck, completely different ball game. So the first submission I usually taught was the fist choke. I call it the fist choke. Some people call it a uh, nogi Ezekiel choke. It was actually the first submission I ever learned um, from Hicks and Gracie and the first time I ever took a private with them. And I struggled with it for many years. I would still pull it off. It was one of the main submissions I've done my entire life for the last 27 years. But a couple years ago, I got a lot better at it because I, I managed to get a couple details from uh, Henry Aikens, one of Hickson's black belts, so I need to give credit uh, to Henry for this. And the detail relates to how you finish. But I'll show you the setup real quick. So Zach's on his back, point your head that way. The mount I was taught from Hickson was middle mount, arm behind the head, and weight here. And the big emphasis was on transferring my weight into my hand because he, of course, is not going to roll me this way because my post, so he'll roll me that way. And transferring my weight here takes away that roll, right? And that's, that's solid, and that works just as well, even better, actually, from low mount. So I hit behind the head, I'm in here. He tries to roll me that way. Not only have I shifted my weight to my right hand, but again, I'm sprawling my right hip down and doing what? Making my left hip, my left foot light. So Zach goes to roll me that way, and there's just really no way he's going to roll me, right? As he starts to move his hands down to my feet and start to panic a little bit because he wants to get out, I open up his head. And here's where, if you're struggling to finish from mount, um, some, a detail that I think is really important. You need to use your entire body, your chest, your head, your shoulder, to control his head and to open up his throat. So if I'm just upright like this, and I just try and go here, he'll just tuck his chin, move, battle me, and anytime my head's above his head, I'm in more danger of being rolled that way. 
Less danger because I'm in low mount, so I can sprawl and roll me that way. I can still do execute that drag and walk movement, but still dangerous. When I shift to here, it's much harder for him to pull me and roll me that way. And now I use my body to open him up. So try and tuck your chin. He can't tuck his chin at all. It's, it's the, my whole chest and body weight there. Now I make a fist, bring it in, and finish. And the way I was initially taught was here. And I did it that way for years and it works. But every once in a while I can get somebody who's very, very, who's not gonna tap unless they're about to black out. And he'll tuck his chin a little bit or he'll hold out and this became a struggle. So the final detail that I picked up again from Henry was to open him up, get my fist in here, then lay my chest, the middle of my chest over, his, over my fist, relax it, and then I expand my chest. <clears throat> now it's my entire back that's closing off that space. So you're here, open them up with your body, fist comes in, make a solid fist, not a relaxed fist, a solid fist so nothing, no energy gets dissipated as you drop your weight. Then my chest lays over it, then I relax, and then I expand my chest. And my fist is gonna go down to here, and I promise you he's gonna tap. That's the first one. And honestly, I would spend my time drilling, holding mouth, and then just working that submission and, and getting better at it. And then you're gonna find that opens up Ezekiel's arm bars, and it makes it much, much harder for him to escape with a knee elbow escape or a hydraulic because he can't abandon his neck. He has to grab my hands. Continuing on with ways to finish from mount top, a question I actually received online was finishing the Ezekiel choke with the gi from mount top. It's very similar. So if you, again, if you're not using your whole body to open them up, it can be a struggle because they'll tuck their chin. And it's, it's interesting because there's a trade-off in jiu-jitsu. The chokes that are easier to get are oftentimes a little harder to finish with. And the chokes that are harder to get are oftentimes a little easier to finish with. I'm painting with a broad brush, but that's usually the case, right? So the easier it is to acquire, the harder it is to finish. Easier it is to finish, the harder it is to acquire. That's kind of a a rule of thumb you'll see very often in jiu-jitsu. The Ezekiel choke, this one is a little harder to get, but I think for most people, until, especially until you get the feel of using your whole body on the fist choke, it's a little easier to finish because the finish is different. For the finish, all I really have to do is extend my arms. So again, we're here in low mount. First thing is getting your hand in there, and that's the struggle. If we've rolled a few times and he knows I like to do this, he's gonna make that life difficult for me. So again, I open him up, try and tuck your chin. Right? But then getting your hand in here from this position and keeping this weight can be hard. So one of the other things I'll do is I'll use my head. So tuck your chin. So if he can't tuck his chin, what I'll do is turn his face this way. Turn your face this way, look this way. Yes. And now I can't get it in, right? You have to imagine somebody that's really fighting, fighting not to get submitted here. So I open him up and then I drop my head. Try and turn your head. So now his head's trapped. Then my fingers, Go into my gi, at least four fingers, and I knife hand into the throat. And that's what makes this a little easier to get. I don't have to do this one. I just have to slip the knife hand in. Once I do that, I can sit straight up to finish. So we're here, open them up with the chest, pin with my head here, and then straight up. And again, what's the big threat from here? Is he going to elbow knee escape? Probably not, right? If I was if he was three quarters of the way into an elbow knee escape and I attack the submission, he might. Your danger here is being rolled. So anytime you're attacking the upper body with your hands so that you're not able to post, your hips and your legs have to be really awake and paying attention to what's going on down here. So there's two games going on at once. So while, while I'm attacking up here, he's going to grab my hands and we're in a battle here. I know he's gonna try and roll me. So when he goes to try and roll me, again, that drag and walk motion becomes very important. So as he goes to lift his hips, I'm sprawling down, my other leg is light. Right, and I might have to do that two or three times while I battle to get my choke in and finish. And your ability to do that, to be able to sprawl and hold top and not get rolled, will exponentially increase your ability to finish this choke. So I've been talking about when we attack the upper body and the neck, it's, you're gonna get rolled. And so it's really important your lower body is defending at the same time as your upper body. So one drill I taught at most of the seminars throughout that year was a low mount drill where you just practice not getting rolled. 
So I'm going to take my low mount. I'm going to let Zach hold double overhooks and wrap my arms up tight. And it's important here not to put your wrists on the mat, your hands on the mat. You could get wrist locked, accidentally hurt yourself. So hug his shoulders, grab my arms tight. Right. And so I'm vulnerable here to being rolled either way. And now as he starts to roll me, he's going to start slow, go back. And when I tell him, and he's going to try and roll me towards the camera, go. And I start my dragon walk motion. So you'll see I'm keeping my left leg tight. I'm not great finding his leg. Go to roll me again. I'm not doing that. This pressure here, straighten your leg, creates that opening, right? Go back. But if instead, go to roll me, I'm here, straighten your leg. See my foot's still there. So I want my calf to actually hug his leg, the back of his thigh. So he goes to roll me, I'm here. And my other foot is light, right? So if I'm slow, I'm not getting it trapped. And I'm in a good transition. Then he tries harder. Right, then he goes the other way. And then throughout the course of a one or two minute round, he starts, tries to get sneakier, starts to mix it up. And keep in mind, like I say to the students every time I'm teaching, failure is an essential part of the process. So you, you want to get rolled once or twice during that round. And that way you know you're actually drilling with enough pressure to get some timing from it. And then if he gets to the point where he can't roll you at all, you gotta have him really try as hard as he can, get really explosive. And once you can shut that down, which you will, if you do five, six, seven rounds of this, or you'll, or you'll make it very, very hard for the guy to roll you on top. Your ability now and confidence when it comes to attacking that part of his body goes straight up and life gets much harder for, for him. One other question I, I got quite often, especially as the seminar would progress and people started to get better at low mount, was how to get low mount um, when you can't get your feet underneath the guy on bottom. <clears throat> and it's true, sometimes when you mount, it's hard to connect your feet together, which is a, at least the prayer foot position is a very important part of low mount. A lot of that has to do with how you mount. So I'll give you one example real quick. Based on a mistake that a lot of people make when they mount, so I'm gonna show you the, the off, uh, defensive movement and then I'm gonna show you the counter. The counter to this defensive movement will actually help you acquire the mount I'm talking about in many other situations. So I'm on bottom here. Said I've gotten into a bad position. Zach's killed my arm. I'm here, and he's just going to go ahead and uh, has a cross face on my head, and he's going to go ahead and mount. And as soon as he mounts, I'm going to oopa in the direction he was. Go back. We'll go back. Just mount a little quicker, like you would in a match. Cross face. So all that's happening there. We're going to slow. As he mounts, most people are going to be vulnerable where they came from. Go back. Because their weight is kind of going over here. Go again. Just mount. Go back. So as he mounts, go. All I have to do is trap the leg. His arm's already trapped. And then, of course, he's going in the correct direction. Very vulnerable to being rolled. I can't tell you how many times I've done that based on his mistake that he's making. Now, if we switch positions, lay down. I'm going to ask Zach to do the same thing. I'm going to mount him and ask him to roll me this way. There you go. So now I'm going to mount Zach the same mount and ask him again to roll me this way. I have a cross face, I have an underhook, I'm set out I'm in a good spot. So again, maybe try a little harder this time to roll me in the direction of that now. So if you look slow at what I'm doing, we'll go again. If I'm not normal here, roll me, boom. Very vulnerable to being taken in that direction. Because what I'm doing is I'm putting my knee on the mat. But instead, what I do here, in my mount position, is I hook my heel to his body. So I connect my heel right away. In fact, let's turn this way. People can see a little better. Perfect. So as I mount, I hook my heel and I'm rolling here into that position. Go to rolling. And there's just no way. And then I can shift back to normal. 
I'm less worried about getting rolled here because why? Because my posting arm is available there. All right, so now I'm not gonna get rolled right and left. I can hold top, but you also notice when you mount that way, I'm automatically getting into that low mount position. That should help quite a bit. So I hope that helped. Um, if you like any of those details, if some of those helped you, I'll tell you that in the new um, upcoming mount release I have, which is the first instructional video that I've put out on the market in I think 15 or 16 years, there's tons of just that. It's all about low mount top. Um, and one thing I'd say by way of where the information comes from, to me it's very important to give credit where credit is due. That's part of our integrity. And credit for this curriculum goes to my coaches and to the original, many of the original legends of BJJ. Chris Howder, of course, first and foremost. Hickson as my first influence. Uh, people like Henry Akins. I've taken material from here and Gracie. Um, they all have really good things to offer. And what I like to talk about when I teach my seminars is what I do is I'll go back, I should also mention Hodger. I'll go back if I'm looking at a position like Mount and I'll look to the people who, who I believe have fantastic world-class mounts. And I'm not asking, you know, what can I figure out that they don't know or how, how am I gonna revolutionize that? I'm not arrogant enough to think that, that that's not where I'm coming from. Instead, I look and see what do they have in common and what maybe have I missed? And so I rewind the tape and go back to the very, very foundation of what they're all doing that's similar. And details that I may have missed as a white belt. And I miss so many details as a white belt. And the problem with that isn't my coaches, we all do. Because jujitsu, when you first start to learn it, comes at you with this flood of information. And in the beginning, in the first couple of years, you don't really know what's valuable and what's not valuable usually. So a lot of details get missed. So in that sense, my approach to Brazilian Jiu Jitsu and my approach to developing curriculums like this is more akin to archaeology than it is um, some sort of new scientific development. I, I consider myself a Jiu Jitsu archaeologist. I go back to the real legends of our sport, people like uh, Hickson and Chris Howder and uh, Hodger Gracie, and I mine their information for the gold that I find valuable. I then add that into my games, I teach it to my students. Every time I teach a class, I move things around and change things based on how the students reacted, questions that they had. And sometimes I'll find that uh, even just giving out the information in a different order is something that makes everybody learn uh, quicker. And anything I can do to accelerate your growth as a student, I do. So it's a never ending process of constantly trying to perfect the curriculum until eventually I get to something that I'm pretty happy with. And I'm glad to say that after several years, I'm pretty happy with this mount curriculum. So I hope you enjoy it. I look forward to seeing you on there.